Hello students, in this lesson we're going to go over one of Capablanca's famous endgames. And even though this position seems very ordinary, it seems very simple, it became really important because of the way that Capablanca annotated it. And basically what he did, he introduced a new way to think about endgames. And this rule that he introduced is called the several moves in a row rule. You're going to see it's something very simple, like many of the things that Capablanca did, they're very simple, but they make a huge difference in your game. Now, even if you tell me, like a lot of my students guys, that the moment I show them this, they tell me, oh, I knew this, I was doing it already in my games. Even though I know it's not true, it doesn't really matter because even if you knew this, in this end game, we're going to be able to learn about many other things. We're going to also go over the take it easy rule. This is something that uh, I never knew that was the name for it, but it is extremely important, not only in end games, but in your game in general. Also, we're going to see how Capablanca used the threefold repetition, that simple rule that we learned in lesson number eight. He used it as a psychological tool and you're going to see how you can do the same guys. And then lastly, we're going to have an opportunity to briefly talk about the principle of the two weaknesses. This is something that we have to dedicate a lesson to it, but it is extremely important, guys. So again, stay tuned. I know that we have a lot left to talk about the King Sinian defense. We have talked about it for the last five lessons or so, and we're going to go back to it. But as you may know by now, I like to talk about openings, uh, middle game, end games. So let's take a break from it uh, just for a little bit to talk about end games, middle games, and then we're going to go back to opening skies. So stay tuned and let's talk more about this end game. Okay guys, so before we start, just know that in the description for, for this video, I'm leaving the link to the entire game. I'm just going to take it from here because I'm interested in the end game. But if you want to look at the entire game, I'm leaving the link in the description. This was a game played in Moscow in 1936. And once they got to this position, it was the white pieces to move. Capablanca is playing with the white pieces. And the first thing that I need from you guys, before I tell you the way Capablanca annotated it, before I tell you the plan and the evaluation, I would encourage you to do this on your own. Take a moment now, pause the video, and try to evaluate this position. Who's better? What's going to be your plan? Not your next move, but your plan. And like we've done before, I really appreciate it if you leave it in the comments, guys. Right now, as you think about it, you can put it in the comments uh, first for your own notes, second for me to see where you are at when it comes to endgames. And knowing where you guys are is going to help me prepare lessons that are going to help you more. So help me help you and do this in the comments. If you don't want to put it in the comments, then just think about it for yourself. But before you continue with the video, try to think about this position for a few minutes and then you compare to what Capablanca did. Okay guys, so the first thing that Capablanca annotated is that his plan has to do with preventing the C-pawn from advancing and he wants to control the board up to the fifth rank. And I understand this could be confusing, like how he's going to control uh, the board up to the fifth rank. Well, basically, now when I show you uh, the other items in his plan, I'm going to show you the position that he had in mind. And quickly, you're going to understand what this rule that I mentioned before, that several moves in a row rule is all about. So basically, he starts with this. I want to prevent this pawn from, uh, from advancing and I want to control the board up to the fifth rank. Now, to do this, he has a few items in mind. Number one, he wants to put his king on the square e3. And from there, we could even go to d4. Second, he wants to put his rook on c3. By the way, guys, notice how his pieces, he's placing them on dark squares. We want to use squares opposite to the color of this bishop. We don't want that bishop to be able to do anything. So we're talking about king e3. Uh, maybe we could go to d4. We're talking about the rook on c3. We're talking about this knight on d4, this pawn on b4 this pawn on f4 and only then we're going to start advancing the queen side pawns notice how we have a pass pawn and that's going to be where our win is on the king side i know that you know this by now in the course but on the king side we have the same amount of pawns so we're not going to get anything from there there's no uh, advantage no imbalance but on the queen side we have a protected pass pawn but before we do so again our king is going to e3 our knight is going to d4, our pawn is going to b4, and our other pawn is going to f4. 
four. So we're gaining a lot of space. We're activating our pieces to its, its maximum. Oh, and the rook is going to, to c3. And only then, guys, we're going to be working on our pawn majority. Now, this is extremely important, guys. A lot of people, they have a pass pawn like that. And the first thing they do is they just put the rook behind it. They push. The pawn gets in trouble. They lose the pawn. And then they get a draw or they move on to lose the game. And notice how in this position, if you have gone over lesson, I want to say 74, notice how bishop and rook we know is a better combination than knight and rook. Plus, we have an open position, meaning the bishop is better than the knight. And we even have pawns on both sides of the board. So all of these things indicate that the black pieces have the superior minor piece. However, all of this is secondary because the white pieces have an extra pawn. So with that in mind, let's talk about the several moves in a row rule. Basically what that means, and this is something that Capablanca, as simple as it might sound to you, he introduced it many years ago and it revolutionized the way people thought about endgame. So what this rule tells you is you need to know where your pieces are going to be. You need to know where you want your pieces to be at and then we're going to start doing this. So it's going to take us several moves in a row to do this, but the key is you're never going to see Capablanca giving a specific variation. He's not going to say how many moves it's going to take him. So he's not going to be like first a rook, first a knight. No, he knows where the pieces go and then he's going to start working on it. It might take him six moves or 20 moves. He might put the knight here first and then the king or the king first and then the knight. And guys, this has a lot to do with the philosophy that we're following in this course with the openings up to this point. We have learned a lot of systems where you just need to know where your pieces go. The move order is not so important. We just need to know where they go. So with that said, guys, you're going to see how Capablanca turned this position into this position. And notice how after so many moves, he got to his king to d4. The rook is on e3. The knight is on c3. Notice how initially we talked about the rook being on c3 and the knight on e3. And he got that done. But then he had to do some adjustments and the pieces ended up like this. The point is that his pieces are extremely active and now he's going to start uh, capitalizing on this advantage that he has on the queen side. Look at the pawn on b4, pawn on f4, and notice now how uh, the black pieces are not that good. The bishop is not as active, the rook uh, is putting pressure on a3, but it's not doing much. And of course we're preventing the c-pawn from advancing just like he had in mind. Now this is a position that you're going to see uh, a few moves ahead. But something like this is what we're working towards. So let's go back here and let's see how Capablanca kept it simple. The first move he did was knight to d4, guys. So the first piece coming to a dark square, it looks like we're just putting pressure on the bishop, but this is just the beginning of our plan. So rook b7, putting pressure on the pawn. Guys, many of you might be thinking now, huh, let's get rid of the of that bishop, get him isolated pawn, and then we walk into an endgame where we have an extra pawn. This should be uh, really easy. Well, uh, I cannot disagree with that. I think that's a good continuation, just doing 96, F takes, and, and so on. But you have to always remember this. Rook and pawn's endgame are very joyous. They're very complex, and they give your opponent a lot of possibilities to create a draw. And that's where the take it as a rule comes in. I have never known it uh, with, the, with that name, but it basically comes down to something that I tell my students over and over and over. Once you're ahead, we want to capitalize, we want to convert our advantage, but it's very important that we keep our opponent's counterplay at its minimum. So we don't want to give him any edge to create draw. So in this game, Capablanca decided not to take. So instead, he just went pawn to b4, and this is consistent with his plan. So we already have the knight there, then the pawn, and notice how, again, he never gave a specific uh, continuation. Now it makes sense because the pawn is being attacked, so we have to do this anyways. So we put the pawn on b4. Now, bishop d7, pawn to f4, dark square, dark square, dark square. The bishop is not able to put pressure on any of them. Now, king e7, centralizing the king. I'm not even going to say why this is important, guys. You should know by now. Uh, that we have to centralize the king. So after king e7, we have king f2, same thing, bringing the king towards the center, rook a7, and now again, a move that Capablanca had already in mind. It's part of the plan, and now is when it's necessary. We need to defend the pawn, we're going to go rook c3. Again, a move that we had talked about even when he was initially preparing his plan. So 
king d6, then rook d3, the king goes back to e7, then king e3, finally the king gets to e3, just like we had mentioned it, and then after rook a4, guys, we have rook c3. We put the rook back, and now if you think about it, this is exactly, uh, it checks the items that we had talked about before. All of our pieces are where they are supposed to be. And now it's time to try to start making progress on the queen side. Guys, uh, some of you, uh, some of my students, they mentioned the move king e4. Just trying to uh, improve that king, maybe go to d5, maybe even to e5. But there is one thing that we have to keep in mind. They could do c5. And after a move like c5, let's say we just accept that pawn and we take. The bishop could go to c6, check. Notice how we cannot take because the rook is pinned. And after we move the king, let's say king e5, they could do pawn to f6, then king f5. And this is something that I have uh, gone over with a lot of my students when we talk about it. And the point is that even if we go, let's say, rook g3, bishop d5. Now, even if we take on g7, and what I do is, uh, when we're doing this in person, I haven't finished it. We just take the timer, we put a few minutes on the timer, and I haven't played it. That way they get more experience. But the point is that now this bishop is active. The rook is even more active. We don't have connected pawns anymore. They're actually isolated. And more importantly, we're giving our opponent counterplay. So again, this is the take it as a rule. So you could remember it like that or just remember to not give your opponent any counterplay. This is what they're looking for. If we're playing a game and we're the ones losing, we're going to be trying to complicate the game. We have nothing to lose. We're already in trouble. So any small edge, we could convert it and maybe even draw the game. And this is especially true when we're playing Blitz or when we're playing a serious game and we get to time pressure. And guess what? When you're playing a serious game, guys, even if you start with two hours, you might get into an end game. And by the time you get to the end game, you already have only a few seconds left or a few minutes. So it is important that you keep your opponent away from any counterplay that you don't get in trouble. So going back here, that's why Capablanca, instead of activating the king, he just went rook c3. So he knows this is something that could create counterplay. Well, rook c3, putting pressure on the pawn and at the same time preventing it from moving. So after rook c3, king goes back to d6. And guys, look at this now. Capablanca here goes back to d3, then king e7, rook c3, and king d6. Let's talk about this for a moment. And I mentioned this, I mentioned the threefold repetition, how he uses it. As a psychological tool now notice how he has repeated this position twice if if we repeat it one more time it is going to be a draw now why do we want to do this well there are a few small things here number one when you do this guys you're, you're in the lead you do this uh you attempt to do the three four repetition number one it gives you time to think so you repeat back and forth two times if you have an increment on the timer, you get that time. Also, you're using that time to think about your next move, your plan. But there's something else. There's something a little bit deeper. If you are the one on the other side, guys, if you're the black pieces, and you know that you're inferior, you're losing in this game, whenever you see your opponent repeating the position, you get like this sense of hope that if he does that again, it's going to be a draw. And you might even think that he's going to do it. So psychologically, you're getting a little bit happy and then... When they just don't repeat on the third time, like in this case, Capablanca just did 92, it, it just psychologically, it really affects you. And you might think it's not true. You might think, oh, it's not a big deal. But it is, guys. When you've been playing a chess game for hours, you get to a position that you're inferior. You're suffering here. You're using your time a lot. And finally, you see a little bit of hope and then your opponent takes it away from you. People just get affected psychologically and they do something desperate. And that's when you get him. So just keep this in mind. If you're in a position that you're superior, consider doing this just to affect your opponent a little bit. So give it a try. You're going to let me know at some point in the future if you ever tried, if you if you sensed that uh, it helped. So anyways, with that said, guys, after knight e2, then pawn to g6, rook d3 check, the king goes to e6, then king d4. So now we're getting closer to the other position that I showed you. Notice how we move the knight, now the king. We're rearranging the, the pieces because we need to make progress. So after king d4, this rook goes back to a6. Then check, king d6. Now the knight goes to c3. We're not blundering the pawn. If they took, 
we have a discovered attack on the rook. So check, and then we get that rook. So pawn to f5, and we have gotten to that position that I showed you before. This is the dream position. Our pieces are where they need to be at, and to make things even better, these pawns now are making this bishop a little bit worse. They're in the same color as the bishop, and it is time now to start pushing these pawns, guys. We have to see if we want to do a4, if we want to do b5, if we want to do something else before we push them, but we have to start making progress. So in this game, they went pawn to b5, rook goes to a8. Again, taking the pawn doesn't work because the rook is on the same rank. We could do check and then we take on, on a3. Just to give you uh, some idea. So if they took, you're going to get something like this. Knight e4, f takes, we collect the rook, bishop takes on b5, and then after rook g3, guys, we're going to be taking this pawn. This should be a very easy endgame to finish. So let me go back. And after b5, we have rook a8. And now our pieces need to come over to the queen side. So the king is coming to c4, uh, trying to get to b4 as well. So after bishop e6, check. King b4. Then pawn to c5, check. And then at this point, notice that the only move that we have at our disposal is en passant. So we talked about this move also, I think, uh, lesson on lesson number six. So b takes a six, en passant. And now, guys, the king cannot even take right away. So they went bishop g8. Now, we're not even going to try to hold on to that pawn. We're happy with this check. The king takes. And guys, even though we traded our b pawn for their weak c pawn, we still have a passed pawn and at least they're going to have to give us their minor piece for that pawn so this should be a pretty simple endgame now to win so after king c6 we have rook d3 cutting that king off a little bit more and not only that we're threatening to go to d6 and collect this pawn now this is um, an opportunity guys to talk about the principle of the two weaknesses this pawn on a3, as you may know, is a liability for the black pieces. So we can say this is a weakness for the black pieces. Now, whenever we have a situation like this, many times your opponent is going to do a great job at blocking that or taking care of that weakness. But then, in many cases, the best way for you to make progress is to create a second weakness. And typically, you're going to do that on the other side of the board. Like... It's not exactly what happened here, but notice now how these pawns are weak on the other side. So if we start putting pressure on them, either with this direct check or just going rook g3, they're going to have to take care of this pawn and at the same time bring pieces to defend on the king side. Typically, it's not like this. Typically, you have to start pushing your pawns to create that second weakness. But in this case, we already have that on the board. So just keep that in mind. Next time that you have a pass pawn, you have the upper hand on one side of the board, think, okay, I cannot make any more progress. What if I just create something on the other side? And again, we're going to have a lesson just on this principle. So anyways, after rook d3, we have pawn to g5, trying to get rid of those, uh, of those weaknesses. Then rook d6, anyways, king b7, f takes c5. I know some of you might be thinking of just taking on a6, is it better? Well, truth is, guys, that after we take on a6, they could do g takes a4 uh, with the idea of doing bishop d5, and it is not so clear for the white pieces. So again, we want to take it easy. We don't want to give our opponent any counterplay. So instead, we take here. This seems very simple. We're not giving our opponent any ways to activate the bishop, to put pressure on our other pawns. So we're going to take it slow. We're not going to let go of this position. So... After h takes g5, now rook g6, you see they cannot protect that pawn. It is on a dark square. The bishop cannot defend it. Going to g4 is also going to lose the pawn. Way simpler. Always keeping in mind we cannot give our opponent any counterplay. So rook goes to f8. Then, of course, we take on, uh, on g5. Then pawn to f4. And again, guys, we got to think, what is our opponent looking for? They're looking for f3 trying to create some counterplay. So Capablanca is thinking, I know I'm winning, but I cannot risk to draw this game. Now, I'll be thinking, if I'll be playing this position, I'll be thinking, I have thrown away so many positions like this that I know I cannot give my position the slightest edge. I have done this. 
I have been playing fast. I have been focusing on just pushing the pawn. And my opponent manages to turn things around. Sometimes they even beat me because of time pressure or for because I blunder later on. So I don't want to give him that edge. So instead, knight d4, there's no f3 anymore. So anytime they see the light at the end of the tunnel, we just close it again. They cannot do anything. So again, guys, after knight d4, rook goes to c8. You see, looking for something again. We got to keep it simple. So now we just go check. The king goes to b6. Then rook g6 check. The king goes to b7. And now knight to b5. After rook g6, king b7, knight b5. We have rook f8. We were trying to do a fork. So they went back to f8 and protect the pawn plus trying to do f3 again. So now at this point after rook f8, we have knight d6, king goes to b8, and then pawn to h4. Guys, at this point, the black pieces here just resigned. There's not much they could do. Um, f3 right now is not going to work because of the, the bishop being hanging, but even if they, if they did it, even if they found a way, the king is too passive. We have two pass pawns, and it's going to be really hard for the black pieces to create anything. Now, notice how Capablanca went from this position to this position. That's exactly what he had in mind. And then he was able to little by little keep his opponent away from creating anything and he got to this final position. Now from here, if you want to do this the right way, I encourage you to do something that we have talked about before, guys. We talked about it in lesson 72. Feel free to go to Lee Chess, go to Tools, then you go to Board Editor. You could do this also on chess.com, but we have used this in the past. And then guys, from here, set that final position. Just put the pieces where you want them to be. And then you go to where it says, continue from here. So if I chose, I mean, this is not the position, but if I just click on continue from here, I play with the computer and try to choose the most difficult level, right? So you want to be the white pieces and you finish that position. So take this position, put it there and try to close this game, try to win it. If you're able to win this game against the computer from here, you know that you'll be able to finish it, to close it against anyone. So again, I encourage you to give it a try. If you do, Please let me know in the comments if it worked out for you. Like in the past, many of you have told me, you know what? It took me three times, four times, five, five times to defeat the computer with, from this position. But even if that's the case, you get a lot of practice. You are definitely working on your chess in general. Not only end games, but your chess in general. So like always, guys, I'll talk to you in the comments and I'll see you in our next lesson.